Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Alec Iger and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Brad Broser. He earned a BA from the University of Notre Dame, a PhD from Indiana University, and was a scholar in residence at the University of Colorado Boulder. Currently, he holds the Russell Amos Kirk Chair in American Studies and is a professor of history at Hill State College, Michigan. He served on the board of the Free Enterprise Institute and the Center for Cultural Re Renewal. Additionally, he is a fellow with the Foundation for Economic Education, Intercollegiate Studies Institute, the McConnell Center, and the Center for Economic Personalization in Brazil. He is a co-founder of the imaginative conservative website, along with Progarchy.com, a site about music exploration. Not only does he spend his time becoming an accomplished scholar, but he also enjoys baking, cooking, hiking, Legos, music, and being with his family. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Berther. Thank you very much. That was a really nice introduction. I, uh, the, the Lego stage is actually kind of ending, uh, which was sad. Over Christmas, not one of my kids asked for Legos for Christmas, and we ended up buying them some anyway, more for nostalgia than anything else. But my oldest is now 24. My youngest is 12, so there was a moment there where Legos were everything, <laughs> but uh, that, that is past just a little bit. Uh, but what a great phase that was. That was, uh, that was wonderful. So good afternoon, everyone. It's really good to be here and uh, great to have you here. As uh, it was mentioned in the introduction, uh, I'm a fellow and uh, with the McConnell Center. It's one of the, the things that I treasure most prizely, uh, I most uh, I prize most greatly of the accomplishments I've been able to have. And of course, that's due to, to Gary and to our, our very lifelong friendship. So it's great to be here and uh, really nice to be able to talk to you. So this morning, I, I want to talk about Robert Nisbet. And in particular, I want to look at his relationship to Edmund Burke and then to Alexis de Tocqueville and look at the lineage that there is there. But I also, and hopefully you guys had a chance to read through this article, I also want to talk a little bit about his attacks on Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, which are, are stringent. And certainly he thought that Rousseau was kind of the main bad guy in all of modernity. So I want to try and break that down and show, and I, I think one of the things that's great about Nisbet, he comes out of this, this Annus Mirabilis, this great year of miracle, 1953, where he publishes this book, this book's a later edition, but he publishes this book called The Quest for Community, which was really one of the most important books of the 20th century, and I think we've forgotten it, unfortunately, but was an amazing book and had a huge influence, not just on conservatism, and Robert Nisbet is very much a conservative and rooted in the conservative tradition, but he also had a huge influence on leftism in the 1960s. So he was adored by young, America's, young Americans for Freedom, which was the kind of major right-wing movement on campus in the 1960s. But he was also adored by the Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, which was the main left-wing organization on campus. And I find that fascinating that this work, even though written by a conservative scholar, would have such a deep influence on the politics of the 1960s on both sides, not just on one side, which I think we could imagine, but on both sides. And I think that one of the reasons that we remember Nisbet more than some of the other figures who were writing in 1953, and I'll give you a list here of some great books from 1953, but I think we remember him more than others because he's not just a critic. Conservatives are always very, very good at critiquing. It's, it's what they do best. They can criticize anything, anywhere, anytime. But conservatives are also equally weak at problem solving. They're equally weak at finding solutions to things. So they're wonderful critics of the past, maybe our best critics, but they're not so good about the future. And Nisbet always made sure that even though he criticized things, he also brought in possible solutions for how we might be able to fix those things as well. And I think that's probably what made him so attractive to both the left and the right of the 1960s. So 1953, an incredible year. Uh, some of you may be familiar with it. It was also the year in which Russell Kirk published The Conservative Mind, which really defined post-war conservatism. 
It was the same year that Leo Strauss at the University of Chicago published Natural Right and History. It was the same year that Ray Bradbury, the great science fiction writer, wrote Fahrenheit 451. So there were a number of really important books that came out in 1953, all trying to deal with the United States after World War II. You can imagine we're only eight years after the war, trying to reassess what our battle against the Nazis had really been about, but then also to look at what the United States would be doing in its fight against communism as well at the beginning of the Cold War. So I hope you don't mind. I'm actually going to read quite a bit. Uh, I want to make sure that the kinds of things I say are stated directly. So rather than just lecture straight off, uh, I want to read from a paper that I've written for this occasion, uh, a paper that deals specifically with Robert Nisbet as de Tocquevillian and trying to figure out what that relationship is. But I'll, I'll do my best to keep this entertaining and not to, to keep this dry. So like most Americans during the Great Depression, Robert Alexander Nisbet, our hero here, born in 1913, passes away in 1996, so very much a man of the 20th century, considered himself, again, like most Americans, to be a proponent of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. But at the age of 23, sometime after he completed his undergraduate work and was just beginning to complete his graduate or, or begin his gra uh, graduate work, this Californian, he was a Californian, he had spent his entire life except for two years when he was in Macon, Georgia. He spent his entire life in California. He was precocious and he encountered a really great English scholar, someone we've forgotten almost completely, a guy by the name of Hilaire Belloc. Belloc was both, most known in his time for being a good friend, the best friend of G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton, I'm sure you've heard of. Belloc, we don't remember as well, but they, they went together in the same way that we might put together Holmes and Watson or Batman and Robin. We would always put together Chesterton and Belloc. And one of the images of those who didn't like Chesterton and Belloc is they created this kind of monster called the Chester Belloc. And that was actually in British satire. You could see this image in cartoons of the Chester Belloc. But Belloc had considered himself a liberal, but he was a liberal in the 19th century sense. Belloc's book 19, in 1912, The Servile State, not only defended the person's right to private property ownership, but Belloc believed that the solution to a good society was to have everybody owning property, exactly the opposite of Marxism. Marxism wanted no one to own property. Belloc wanted everyone to own property, everyone to be a personal property holder. And we have, of course, that long tradition in America, Thomas Jefferson, Booker T. Washington. We have this long tradition of trying to get everybody to own property overall. As such, Belloc savaged what would later be known as crony capitalism, the idea that the capitalists would actually work with the state. When Nisbet read this book 24 years after its initial publication, it hit him then, being liberal and pro-FDR, very hard. After all, Nisbet reasoned, Belloc had predicted the morass of the 20th century long before World War I and the Great Depression and long before the rise of fascism and communism in the totalitarian states. By comparison with 1936, the year in which Nisbet finally read this 1912 book, 1912 seemed like an age of innocence. How had the English man prophesied so well? To be sure, Nisbet admitted, Belloc saw almost the entirety of the Western tradition since the Reformation as a great fall. As a non-Catholic, however, Nisbet found this line of argumentation interesting, but more than a bit excessive. Still, he concluded, Belloc had to have figured out something before everybody else. Whatever it had been, Nisbet admired Belloc. And then reading de Tocqueville's Democracy in America three years later for the first time in 1939, this only solidified Nisbet's hatred of the planned managerial state, whether it went under the name of communist or fascist or democratic. As with Belloc, he saw those who lived under the state as servile 
and with de Tocqueville, he believed that whatever managerial aspects had and would arise in America would be the forms of a soft despotism rather than a thriving democratic society. And I see that you guys have right up here the four volumes of Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. I brought one of those volumes. If I had known that they were right there, I would have just grabbed that one rather than brought mine from, from Hillsdale. But at the end of Democracy in America, de Tocqueville makes the statement that if despotism ever comes to America, it will never be obvious. It will always be subtle and it will smother us like a big sister or a loving mother in all kinds of rules, all kinds of ideas that don't allow us to think fully, but instead prevent us from even imagining that we could do something. And so we might see a homeless person and think, how do we deal with homelessness? De Tocqueville says that the government will become so strong in a democratic society that we see, simply see a homeless person and we say, the government will take care of that. We no longer have the imagination for ourselves to take care of that, but we pass it on to someone else. So by the end of his formal academic career in the late 1970s, Nisbet considered this chance encounter with the servile state. Remember, the book was from 1912, but he didn't read it until 1936, to be the great turning point of his life, along with three years later, reading de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. And there were a couple of books that Nisbet really, really cherished. Some we've forgotten, some we remember. He also loved, for example, James Fitzstevens, uh, James Fitzjames Stevens, Liberty, Equality, and Fraternity, a book that Russell Kirk admired as well. Frank Taggart's The Processes of History, and Joseph Schumpeter's Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. From 1936 until his death in 1996, Nisbet dedicated at least half, if not more, of his academic career writing about the dangers of the modern nation state. Though he labeled himself a conservative, he had very strong anarchist sympathies. And I would argue that no libertarian, even someone like Friedrich Hayek or Ludwig von Mises, ever went quite as far in criticizing the state as Nisbet as a conservative did. That is, there's the irony that the conservative is more anti-statist than the libertarian. Nisbet despised almost every aspect of modern government. Not government. He believed that government was normal, it was natural, it was something that arose from the human condition. But he believed that the modern state had taken on the role, not just of politics, but of religion as well. And in its propaganda and in its way that it organized us through schooling and so forth, it really was promoting a kind of religion. It was promoting a religion that we would have seen in the ancient world, but not necessarily in the modern world. In his analysis of the modern nation state, Nisbet followed three approaches. First, he found the origins of the modern nation state in the writings of the French philosopher, whom you've read for today, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and in the Enlightenment thinkers' promotion of totalitarianism and equality at the same time. Second, Nisbet promoted the various little platoons and intermediary associations so vital to a thriving society. And I would argue if we just want an example of what a good intermediary institution is, this is it right here. This is a great intermediary institution, an institution housed at the University of Louisville but independent from it as well, where all of you come together and you have great ideas, you have great discussions, you go on trips to places like Greece and Rome, to England, and you have your own little platoon. That is, you have your own community here within a larger community. And then I'm sure some of you in the room brought, belong to sororities on campus, or maybe you belong to a religious organization on campus. Those are all thriving intermediary institutions that are not just about the individual, but are about the individual coming together in community to promote some social goal. So I know at least at Hillsdale, and I would assume the same thing is true here, the sororities are always charged with doing things for the community. That is, there's a social justice function and component to their charity. And I would guess that the same thing is true here with various organizations on campus. 
Nisbet argues that it's this kind of organization that really makes society. It's not the lone individual. Individuals are great. You think about someone like Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple Computer. Computer. Individuals can be fantastic. But we don't just look to the individual, and we don't look to the centralized state, but instead we have this group in between things like family, community, church, sorority, fraternity, whatever it may be that we belong to, uh, even groups for adults like the Knights of Columbus, or if you're Jewish, the Daughters of the Maccabees, those kinds of things that have allowed for an actual thriving of civil society. And so that is something that, that Nisbet was very concerned with. And finally, third, Nisbet deconstructed the various parts and aspects of the modern nation state, claiming each to be artificial and antithetical to the natural law and to human dignity. And so in this talk today, this is what I want to consider. First, Rousseau as kind of the great figure of modernity, but then de Tocqueville and Burke as the real fountainheads and touchstones for this idea of local community. And then I want to end with Nisbet's criticism of the modern state. So let's start with Rousseau. Rousseau is, for me, the real demon of the modern mind, Nisbet wrote in a private letter after his masterpiece, that is, The Quest for Community, came out. He says, I think his was the most malevolent genius of the modern era. So if the conservatives of the 1950s created a conservative narrative, a lineage, and a hagiography, as someone like Russell Kirk most certainly did in the conservative mind, they also created a kind of counterpart, a demonology, that is a list of those who had created problems as well. And it began usually with Rousseau and ended with Karl Marx. From his 1940 University of California at Berkeley dissertation called The Social Group in French Thought to his classic in 1953, The Quest for Community, Nisbet deepened his thought regarding this, 19, this 18th century French philosopher Rousseau but he never really changed his mind. In his dissertation, Nisbet argued that Rousseau took the English individualism of John Locke and combined it with the totalitarianism of Thomas Hobbes. Through this unholy alliance of ideas, Nisbet claimed, Rousseau defined sovereignty for the modern world, bypassing all voluntary and intermediate associations and linking each individual instead to the sole organization of the state. As such, Rousseau's theory destroyed family, community, school, church, business, and fraternal and sororal associations. All modern revolutionaries, with the exception of the Americans, Nisbet continued, found solace and certainty in Rousseau. Even in one of Nisbet's last books, called The Present Age, which were his Jefferson lectures for the National uh, uh, Endowment for the Humanities, published eight years before his own death, the author spent a considerable amount of time identifying Rousseau as the fountainhead of all modern totalitarianism. Without Rousseau, Nisbet claimed, there never could have been a Lenin, or a Mussolini, or a Hitler, or a Stalin. He was, according to Nisbet, the anti-St. Augustine, the man who tried to blend the city of man with the city of God, rather than acknowledging how important their separation should be. As a matter of course, Rousseau's thinking must, Nisbet insisted in 1988, lead to a political state as a new Leviathan, that is, a political and secular church. Unlike the horrific tyrants of the 20th century, though, Rousseau was clean in his almost zero body count found in the gulags and the Holocaust camps. So we could look at someone like Marx and we could say Marxism directly led to the gulag, which led to at least 150, 160 million deaths in the 20th century. We could point to someone like Hitler or Mussolini and say that the Holocaust camps killed millions of people. But you can't find that direct line of Rousseau to these people because Rousseau always speaks in a kind of democratic language. 
He's still saying things that are very dangerous, but he does so in a very pleasant fashion. And this is the way, and this gets complicated, the way that Rousseau put this, and he argues this in his great book, The Social Contract, and it is a very important book. But he says that what happens in a society is that each one of us gives over all of our rights and our individuality to the community. And therefore, we each become independent one from another to one another, but dependent upon the community itself. And everything then is centered in the community and the community, whether we call it democratic or fascist or communist, the community decides all things at that point. And so this is where we lose things like family or church or local community because we've given up our individualism, but we've given it over not to the communities that we believe in, which is natural, but instead we've given it over to this great collective, to the state itself and therefore we lose our individuality within the kind of mass conformist society. So Nisbet's most sustained attack against Rousseau, though, came in his widely and justly acknowledged masterpiece, as I've already mentioned, The Quest for Community. Though reusing much of his argument from his academic article, which you read for today, Nisbet's quest brought together all of Rousseau's work before carefully dissecting them. Not surprisingly, he finds on the social contract to be the Enlightenment figure's greatest work. To prosper, Rousseau argued, men must in some way find an escape from the state of nature. In such a state, men possess briefly, and we'll be able to find ultimately a life, but one that is too barbaric. To fight the chaos inevitable in a state of nature, Men must act in concert, solidifying into a body politic. Yet, Rousseau cautions, man must never surrender his freedom to the tyranny of society. Instead, a social compact then, properly implemented, will collectivize without necessarily freeing. To find a form of association that will defend and protect the person and goods of each associate with the full common force, and by the means of which each uniting with all nevertheless obeys only himself and remains as free as before, this serves as the great central paradox of the social contract. As a solution, Rousseau continues, man must break ties with all associations and all subdivisions within community, becoming fully a citizen of the whole. In other words, the only association that will work is the association of the whole, the committee of the whole, in which each person is utterly equal before everyone else, but not proclaiming his or her own rights. A true social compact must involve the total alienation of each associate with all of his rights to the whole community. And that becomes the argument that Rousseau makes, and hence, Rousseau has taken the very strong language of Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, who said that we, in order to get out of a state of nature, which was brutal, nasty, and short, in order to get out of that, we have to form a Leviathan. We have to form a strong, centralized authority that prevents us from killing one another. That's half of what Rousseau's saying. But then half is also coming from John Locke, and John Locke's much more pleasant description of the social contract, which says that in a state of nature, we'll all act pretty good to one another. It won't be a war of all against all. Instead, we'll kind of enjoy each other's individuality. But there will always be one person out of a hundred who will cause problems. And so we each give up a few of our rights in order to prevent that one person from damaging society. So he has a very different view than Hobbes does, but they both promote this kind of state of nature, and then how do you get out of it? Rousseau's genius, which may be brilliant or may be malevolent, his genius is combining the nasty view of Hobbes with the positive view of Locke. And so Rousseau is able to both criticize totalitarianism and also embrace totalitarianism at a certain level. And for someone like Robert Nisbet, Rousseau's greatest demonstration or manifestation of his ability to persuade comes in the French Revolution. 
French Revolution is an almost perfect expression of Rousseauvianism. And if you look, for example, in 1789 at the Declaration of Rights in Man, which was the French equivalent to America's Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, Article 3 of that, says no individual, no community may exist outside of the sovereignty of the nation. So I meet my wife, I want to get married, she wants to get married, we have to get permission from the nation. We want to form a school, we have to get permission from the nation. We want to form a business, we have to get permission from the nation. And that's an absolute inversion of the American model, which the American model was always based on two or three people coming together and forming a community. We want to create the McConnell Center. We form the McConnell Center. We don't need national sovereignty to tell us to do this. We create this in the same way that when you fall in love and get married, you do this of your own volition. You do this of your own free will. You don't need someone above you telling you you can or can't do that. And the same thing is true. I'm Roman Catholic, so I can't do this in my church. But certainly the same thing is true within Protestantism. You want to form your own church, you form your own church. And that's very much a part of the American ethos. You want to form your own business, you form your own business. But Rousseau went against that because, again, you have to believe that it comes from the collective rather than from the bottom up. And that is really the great inversion. The American model is from the bottom up. That is, people interacting with one another, creating community, and that community then growing all the way up, whereas the French model was the opposite, where it's imposed from above, and then those below could either acquiesce to that or give in to the desires of the state. So let me jump to the second thing then. What do we mean by intermediary associations? So first point is on Rousseau. The second point is on intermediary institutions. If in the 18th century French thinker, that is, in Rousseau, we had seen the doom of the modern world for Nisbet, we then find a 19th century French thinker explained what might save the world. So Rousseau, the 18th century French thinker, de Tocqueville, the 19th century French thinker. So as much disdain as Nisbet held for Rousseau, he held equal admiration, if not greater, fondness for Alexis de Tocqueville. Nisbet considered de Tocqueville not just a great of the modern world, but truly one of the greats of world civilization, equal to Socrates or Cicero or Buddha or other great figures, Confucius, within world civilization. De Tocqueville might have been, he might have been, I'm certainly not willing to disagree with this, the greatest thinker of the 19th century as Nisbet believed. But he too, and I think we have to note this, came out of a very long tradition of thought that stretches all the way back to Socrates. But his most recent exemplar had been the greatest of 18th century thinkers, the great Anglo-Irish statesman Edmund Burke. And together, Burke and de Tocqueville stood at the forefront of the conservative and libertarian revival of the mid 20th century that is, of the anti-Nazi and anti-communist revival of thought in the 1940s, the 1950s, and the 1960s, of which Nisbet played such a major part, along, of course, with other figures that I've already mentioned, Russell Kirk, Leo Strauss, Friedrich Hayek, Christopher Dawson, Peter Stanless, and several others, all arguing for the dignity of the human person. Because of Burke's influence on de Tocqueville and on Nisbet, I think it's worth considering his own thought for at least a moment here. In his 1790 masterpiece, Reflections on the Revolution in France, Burke had blatantly talked about the necessity of small government and of small community. He said, we should all be attached to our subdivision. That is, we should love the little platoon to which we belong in society. This is the first principle, the germ, as it were, of all of our public affections. And imagine how difficult it is, if you don't love your family, to then go on and love your community. 
we have our first affections with our mother and our father and our brothers and our sisters and our cousins and our aunts and our uncles and our grandparents. And from there, we extend that affection out to our neighbors and to our church community and to the various groups to which we belong. All of these things are a kind of continuation on a spectrum. So Burke tells us these smaller communities are the link in a series which we then proceed towards a love of our country and towards a love of humanity. And this is exactly opposite, Burke says, of what the French are doing in their own revolution. So Burke then concludes his book, Reflections on the Revolution in France, with this beautiful statement about the meaning of local community. He says, we begin our public affections in our families. No cold relation is a zealous citizen. We pass on to our neighborhoods and then on to our provincial connections. And of course, there are always ends, what he would have called pubs and resting places. And such divisions of our country as have been formed by habit, not by sudden jerk of authority, in which we find so many little images of a great country in which the heart found something to be full. The love of the whole is never extinguished by the love of the part, but quite the opposite. It's our love of the part that makes us love the whole. And so think about what you do here in the McConnell Center. You think constantly about the liberal arts. You think about the political arts. You think about the possibility of what it's like to be a statesman or a stateswoman. You think about the possibilities of governance. You think about the possibilities of political society. You love the part, and then you love the whole. And that's what you're doing here in the McConnell Society. And so this leads to de Tocqueville. De Tocqueville was also, in democracy in America, absolutely fascinated with the idea of association. And he said that no people in the world created better associations and more of them than the Americans. And de Tocqueville goes so far, especially in this translation that we have here, the Liberty Fund translation, de Tocqueville goes so far as to say, the right to associate with one another, that is our right to create family, business, community, schooling, that this is the fundamental right in all of society. Without this right, there are no other rights. There is no right to life or liberty or the pursuit of happiness unless we have the right to form community. That is our primary right. And I'm not sure I'm willing to go as far as de Tocqueville does, but his argument is definitely worth taking seriously that we have that fundamental right. De Tocqueville famously writes, Americans of all ages all conditions, all minds, constantly unite with one another. Not only do they have commercial and industrial associations in which they all take part, but they have a thousand other varieties, religious, moral, intellectual, serious, useless, general, particular, immense, small. Americans associate to celebrate holidays, to establish seminaries, to build pubs, to erect churches, to distribute books, to send missionaries to the foreign parts of the world. In this way, they create hospitals. And I was struck as I passed through southern Fort Wayne yesterday on my way here, huge complex of Lutheran hospitals right at the southern edge of Fort Wayne. And I thought, this is exactly what I'm talking about tomorrow, uh, that here we would have a religious organization that is deeply rooted in that. Other places, you have St. Francis Hospital and so forth. To build prisons, to build schools. If finally it is a matter to bring a truth to light or to the developing of a sentiment with the support of a good example, Americans associate. Wherever at the head of a new undertaking in France, you would see the federal government. In England, a great lord. In America, you will always find an association. And that becomes central to who and what we are. So just as one could not ably or successfully predict the choices of any one individual over the long term, 
one cannot also predict the choices and the various aspects and missions of voluntary associations. Taking together the sum of all associations in America, de Tocqueville argued, one could only admire their infinite art, which each individual association, as well as the whole of associations, full formed and fueled the very life of American society. Not only do Americans solve their various social ills through associations, but associations help create and maintain ethical and morally sound and a well-ordered society. In associations, quote, according to Tocqueville, sentiments and ideas are renewed, the heart grows larger, and the human mind develops only by the reciprocal action of men on each other. They each serve the common good only by the, quote, efforts of the number of men and in making them freely march toward it. Not only has the forming of associations become a habit for Americans, it has, at least in the minds of the citizens of the United States, become the only means imaginable by which a society can solve its problems. The liberty to associate, therefore, is more precious and the science of association more necessary among free peoples than among all the others. It becomes the more precious and the more necessity, especially as equality in society grows. When men and women associate, they feel their power, and that power animates them to greater charity rather than to pride. Whether men and women seek to propagate a new idea or a truth or solve a problem, they seek each other out, and when they have found each other, they unite. So one of the things that de Tocqueville was astounded by, and we should remember he's Roman Catholic and he's a French aristocrat, he met all of these people in upstate New York who had all taken a pledge never to drink alcohol. And he thought this was the weirdest thing ever, that anyone would make such a pledge. But he was utterly aghast that nearly 300,000 people had taken that pledge in America overall through this abstinence organization in New York. And he was shocked by this. And he thought, if you can change this kind of habit, you can change any habit in society. And so he was vacant, very taken with this. But he also warned, he said very importantly, that the Americans through their democracy could lose this. And one of the reasons we could lose it is that through a democracy, we all gain this understanding that we play a role in society. And so the more we democratize, the more we give up our rights to the society because we believe that the society speaks for the people. But in fact, it will become its own thing at some point in which the people themselves will become tyrannized. He says, if the individuals ever lose the habit of solving their own problems with associations, they will begin the slippery slope toward the loss of all of them. Should this ever be the case in America, barbarism rather than civilization would become the norm. The greater government becomes in assuming the powers of associations, whether in ending homelessness, feeding children, or starting and maintaining business enterprises, the more individuals will lose the idea of association and the more government will need to become its aid. There are causes and effects that engender each other without stopping. In other words, it would become this vicious cycle in which we lose the ability to associate, government steps in to take care of societal problems, and then we lose the ability to even believe that we can associate and solve those problems. And again, I, I would promote uh, an idea here, promote an idea, an idea that I wish, it, wish had not happened, but I think the homelessness crisis in America is one of these examples where when we had small community, we took care of our homeless. It was never perfect. Right? We're never gonna be perfect, but we took care of our homeless and as society has grown and has become more anonymous, we more and more turn over our homeless crisis to the federal government to solve. But most of the problems of homelessness are local problems rather than just structural problems. And so the government can solve part of it but it can't solve all of it in the way that if we went out and actually dealt on an individual basis with the homeless that we could take care of. So at the very, gov at the very moment, de Tocqueville writes, that the government tries to emerge from this political sphere in order to throw itself off into a new path, 
it will exercise an unbearable tyranny, even without wanting to do so. So that's our great danger, and that leads me to the final part, and that is this question of Leviathan. And what is Leviathan? So Nisbet had taken in very much not only the Rousseauian idea of what government could do dangerously, but he had also been very taken with the ideas of Burke and de Tocqueville and what could be done through the fashioning of civic society, of our civil processes in society and our creation of community. Nisbet believes that starting with World War I, Americans had become too taken with the idea of military government. And this may have even started as early as the American Civil War, but certainly by the time we get to World War I, we had thrown almost all governance to the American national government. We had done this under the progressives, especially under Teddy Roosevelt and then under Woodrow Wilson, and we had concentrated power in the federal government. This had waned a little bit in the 1920s, but then with Herbert Hoover and Franklin Roosevelt in the Great Depression, we see again this absolute swelling of government. And de Tocqueville says, uh, de Tocqueville, Nisbet says that we always have to be careful because what we'll find is that every time the military arises, the domestic government arises as well. And every time the domestic government arises, so rises the military. And so it's not accidental that when we see the New Deal, we also see World War II, not to suggest that there weren't a million other factors going into World War II, but in the same way that when we jump to the 1960s and we see the great society under Lyndon Johnson, we also have the Vietnam War. Or when we jump forward to George Bush and we see the Americans with Disabilities Act, we also see the Gulf War that these things are always synonymous in one way or another. And this is not to make an argument against social programs coming from the government, but simply to recognize that they've always grown in correspondence with the federal government. And Nisbet believes very strongly that in the 20th century, we had begun to look at our federal government not as a governing institution, in which through expedience it, get things, it gets things done properly, but as our sole community, not as our local community, but we give up our rights to our local community and turn them over to our sole community, that is to the federal government. And he also believed that we, would be, that we had become militarized uh, strongly. So in his Jefferson lectures in 1987, and I mentioned these earlier because they become his book, The Present Age, in 1988, these were the National Endowment of the Humanities lectures, Nisbet begins by asking, what if George Washington suddenly arrived today in Washington, D.C.? What would he think if he walked down the avenues of Washington, D.C. and looked at all the bureaucracies and all the military complexes, and then he looked at all the corporations like General Electric, or these other ones which have huge, huge military contracts, what would he think about that? And Nisbet says he would be utterly shocked that our republic had become so militarized in such a fashion and that our government had grown in so many ways. And so Nisbet says that we have to be very careful about this. He writes, the political sphere captured the allegiance of the modern intellectual in way that only the church had done, say, in the Middle Ages. Around the state was built a clerisy, a priestly class, very much like that which attended the church of the Middle Ages, a clerisy composed, as that one earlier, of scholars, scientists, philosophers, technologists, and all those who know, just as there once had been kings, assemblies, and electorates who actually managed the national state what capitalism could never accomplish, that is, winning over the allegiance of the intellectuals, the political state surely did. And as Lord Maynard Keynes once observed, a very good deal of hard, practical political policy in the West had its origins in the work of some academic scribbler a year or two back. To a striking degree, the modern intellectual has been the political intellectual often as confident of the capability of political power and membership 
therein to save men from temptations of the flesh and other sinful impulses, as the medieval intellectual tended to be, to believe in the capacity of the church and of the city of God. So the state has taken on a religious function overall. So let me just conclude, whether we agree with Nisbet or not, I think we have to take his arguments seriously. Just as he took Rousseau seriously, even in disagreeing with him, I think we have to consider this. I think we have to wonder, have we kind of make an, have we made a religion out of politics? Has the Republican Party become the party of religious fervor? Has the Democratic Party become a party of religious fervor? And have we lost our ability to create family and church and local community at the expense of what the federal government is and what it demands of us? And again, this is not to say we should not have a federal government. I'm no anarchist. But I do believe that it has its proper place. But so does family and so does community and so do our churches. All right. Thank you, guys.